And we're back. Welcome to Abstractable. I'm Ryan and this is Lockie. The Abstractable podcast is for curious people with a desire to learn. The goal is to bring what might appear unattainable or reserved only for the already successful to anyone. In this episode, we talk about the documentary Rolling Thunder Review, a documentary about Bob Dylan by Martin Scorsese. And we discuss the cult of Bob Dylan and why he casts a spell over so many. We also talk about why Bob never looks back and about the tour and the cultural legacy it created and why Bob doesn't really care. Why do we focus on this? Well, it's a great documentary because it dives into how he creates and authentically communicates his unique identity. Um, We also try and decipher how people act in groups or cults behind a quasi-spiritual leader, in this case, Mr. Bob Dylan. You can find the documentary on Netflix and you can find Bob on Instagram at, at Bob Dylan, um, also at bobdylan.com or pretty much anywhere else. He's a well-known person. So we hope you really enjoy the episode. And we're back. How are you, Ryan? I am well. So what are we talking about today? Rolling Thunder Review. Netflix special about Bob Dylan, uh, directed by Martin Scorsese. And thanks for picking me yeah. up on my pronunciation of the director's name earlier, mate. That's all right. <laughs> what were you calling him? I think it was Scorsese. Scorsese. <laughs> that's the Australian version. I think that's the Aussie, the Aussie version. A Scorsese. <laughs> That's what he'd be called over here. Scorsese, mate. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> glad, That's I'm glad great, to see you get a laugh like out of that, mate. So yeah, were you, were you, you. A, were you a fan of Dylan? Not really. Um, I was always aware of him because my uh, one of my best mates, Jimmy, his dad, who I lived n- n- nearby, was obsessed with Bob Dylan, so... Uh, I was always aware of him, but I never really understood it, got it, was very interested, which might actually make this an interesting episode because we're kind of both coming to Dylan for some of the first times in a real way um, because people are obsessed with Bob Dylan and perhaps we can bring an amateur's perspective or a fresh eyes. Yeah, it's quite a, like my only association with Dylan is – um, getting sick to death of hearing knocking on heaven's door when I was, you know, in my under the age of 10 years, you know, at grown up parties or, you know, family gatherings and then being completely turned off his music. Um, yeah. And I think maybe I tried to try to look at it again, to, you know, and I just didn't understand it. So left it, parked it to the side. Um, so yeah. it's nice to come back to. So I, yeah, I, yeah. So I tried it. I tried it a couple of times. Didn't really do much for me. Uh, and then a, probably five years ago, I started listening to his um, a few of his albums, uh, and it just it's emotional music. It's almost hard. Like I actually found it a little bit hard to listen to in some instances because. And then I kind of it kind of struck a chord with me, and it's a bit like watching this documentary. The reason I really wanted to do this as an episode was that I feel like I don't really actually understand what this documentary is actually about, or what he is about. <laughs> I don't understand him. And there's something very enigmatic about watching this, and um, I watched it on a plane, which is usually when you're I'm a bit sleep deprived and it would had kind of going to ask were you hallucinating it's like a trance or something almost cuz throughout the documentary there's like long uh clips of him in concert and essentially the just for context the doco is about a tour that Bob uh, did with a group of musicians in the 70s um broadly uh, what it's actually about we can discuss, but that's the subject matter. Uh, and it's directed by, yeah, like you said, Scorsi. Scorza. Uh, who's pretty 
pretty handy. He's got a few good films under the belt, so it'll be interesting to talk about this. Yeah, well, the most interesting thing for me in digging into the film a little bit is uh, Scorsese, (laughs) with his artistic license, um, appears to have actually created some fictional narratives throughout the actual documentary. So there's actually characters in this film never were part of the, you know, were part of the tour and it just completely made up, which is quite funny. Um, That's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that mind-blowing? And so um, I'm se- I'm half tempted not, not to reveal, but here's a spoiler. If, you know, block your ears for one second, Sharon Stone and uh, Van Dorp, um both appear in this and neither of them had anything to do with um, uh, the tour. So Sharon Stone is appearing as herself and Van Dorp is literally a made-up character played by someone else um, who was the supposed director of the original film at the time. So he's the guy that looks like the the pretentious, um, you know, I don't want to give away this film type thing and uh, throughout the... uh, the show so very interesting that's terrific well there you go so um we thought we'd just quickly touch on scorsese just for anyone that might have been living under a rock um but he's he's 77 years old now uh he's an american film director screenwriter producer and actor and regarded as one of the most influential and significant figures of film ever so um you know, he's been doing his craft for 50 years and he's got endless um, awards and so there's no point in me listing them off, um, much like the, the subject of the, uh, the f- this documentary itself. Um, think of The Goodfellas, The Irishman, The Aviator, Wolf of Wall Street, Shutter Island, and it goes on. He's also done uh, a number of music documentaries before. So he's done The Last Waltz, Shine a Light, which is about the Rolling Stones, one on George Harrison. He did one in the early 2000s on Bob Dylan um, and his earlier career. And then he did one um, uh, just last year, which is Rolling Thunder Review. So he's he's got a portfolio and a half, that man. Knows what he's doing. Um, So... On to Dylan, the subject. Uh, so Robert Allen Zimmerman, he was born in 1941, uh, makes him 78 years, raised Jewish. Um, his grandparents were from Ukraine and Lithuania, and it appears as though he was somewhat um, um, helped in being raised by by them because his father had polio when he was growing up. Um yeah, he form, right. formed several rock bands during high school. Uh, he went to University of Minnesota um, and joined a Jewish-centric fr- uh, fraternity. Um, but this was kind of a, a coming of age for him uh, because he decided that um, the rock that he had been playing as part of his high school band um, wasn't serious enough uh, and didn't reflect... Uh, life in a realistic way um, and that kind of moved him into the, into folk which is kind of a monumental shift for him um, and it was shortly after this that he actually began to introduce himself as Bob Dylan so I don't really know what went on in, you know, in those years and he does have an autobiography which probably elucidates to this um, but it sounds like he had a he had a bit of a rebirth <laughs> Not the only one you'll have, yeah. I would say. Um, so why, why Bob Dylan? Uh, it was inspired by Dylan Thomas, um, which um, was someone that he looked up to uh, at the time. And he says, you're born, you know, the wrong names, the wrong parents. I mean, that happens. You call yourself what you want to call yourself. This is the land of the free. <laughs> And so um, mm. it, it, that kind of summarizes his entire character in one sentence, I think, um, which is great. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he dropped out after his first year of uni um, and started you know, playing more and more gigs 
uh, and he started meeting musicians and semi-renowned um, or f- even famous musicians um, uh, or even other artists. Um, and he said upon meeting uh, Woody Guthrie that he would be his greatest disciple. Um, who was it? Woody Guthrie said that or? No, no, no. Dylan said you know, that, was his, that was his mission. Uh, right. 61, he had his first <clears throat> radio performance um, where he played the harmonica uh, for a folk singer. And that obviously started generating some some popularity, and and then he shortly after uh, got signed to Columbia Records, and then a year later had regi- or within a year later had released his first album, um, which sold mm. for five thousand only five thousand copies, which is a pretty like um, at the time I think just broke even, which is yeah you. Having a copy of one of those now would be <laughs> worth something, I'd say. Well, yeah, more than something. The um, one of his, uh, so the manuscript for his song uh, "Like a Rolling Stone," the original handwritten manuscript uh, for that, I think, was auctioned off just a few years ago for two million dollars. Jeez, like. A couple of bits of paper. It's insane. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. Uh, so he, he, during this time, he was, you know, he was a theme throughout his entire career is this collaboration and meeting people and um, trying lots of different things, experimenting. And so he, he used a lot of different pseudonyms um, to, to build his own brand during this time. And he... Um, uh, also um, played lots of different instruments for different people um, as well as producing his own stuff. So in 1963, uh, he appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show uh, but walked out because they implied that he couldn't play one of his politically inclined songs. So this is really him starting Mm. to come into the public light and showing his, you know, that raw nature, the raw Dylan. Um, but end of, end of 1963, and we've skipped a lot here, um, already, um, because the sixties were massive for him. He, he's got uh, such a deep history, right? It's uh, just, there's too much, too, too much to cover. You could do 10 episodes on his bio, you know? Yeah. Well, his, his, his own autobiography, he released, you know, multiple volumes of, which is a sign that there's a lot going on, a lot to cover. <laughs> um, so he, by the end of 1963, he actually felt like, you know, he'd been somewhat manipulated and constrained by the, by the name he created within the folk and protesting activist name for himself. So, um, in, in 1965, um, or by 1965, he'd released his first album with electrical instruments, and this included the song Mr. Tambourine Man, um, which is another one of his massive hits. Uh, and so that, yeah, you know, at the time, electrical instruments, and even even now I'm sure, uh, I'm not too heavily engrossed in the, in the, folk, the folk industry, but I think it's pretty frowned upon to be... Um, <laughs> to be playing electrical instruments in, in, in folk. So, yeah. so he, he actually, um, he'd headlined it, um, in 1963 and 1964, I think at the Newport folk festival. Right. And so he'd gained, you know, this is during his really big growth and, you know, this upsurge in, in following and 1965, he decided it was a good idea to, to mix, mix in the electric so he performed at a, a full electric performance at that festival and um i think i think he only played three songs um and then there was all this booing there was some cheering it was a, a right. real you know melting pot of of perspectives Con- it was a controversial thing to do yeah right there's different perspectives on what really happened and you know was he booed off stage or did they just not have enough time but I, you know, I think the crux of it is it, I think the booing probably would have, he just would have said, don't worry about it. 
I'll move. I'll move on. So, um, Like a Rolling Stone was produced, I think, in the same year, uh, which has been regarded as the greatest song of all time on many occasions, which is <laughs> that's a that's a pretty big accolade. There's been a few songs. That is not not a bad effort. He, yeah, it really started a, almost a movement, that song, right? Yeah, it did. Yeah. I know the Rolling Stones and the Rolling Stone magazine um, rave about it endlessly. Um, and I think, you know, as I said, quite often appears in, in their own top lists of, you know, greatest songs ever made. Um it just might have must have had just a monumental shift on the way music was you know perceived for that time mm. yeah as well as the lyrical nature of it but yeah i'm definitely no music critique <laughs> no <laughs> um but so basically because of this big move to introduce electrical um facing tough crowds and heckling and um was just became part of the <laughs> part of the the touring ritual, and so he, he even after you know being in collaborations with the likes of the band, um, there was still all this building. And the band is you know was a more electric um, kind of rock focused type band, and even those guys were were getting getting the booze and and heckling. So um, he did get married shortly after to Sarah um, Lowndes and 1966 he toured Australia and the EU um, and did basically half and half so um, electric and acoustic uh, again tons of heckling tons of confrontation and massive drug problem just to just to go with it all um, to, which was you know to get him ah. through the tour yeah, this was this was really interesting because he had a he had a uh, a bad motorcycle accident, and it's it's very unclear as to how bad that motorcycle accident actually was. He said, you know, he broke a few vertebrae, mm -hmm. but apparently he never went to hospital. Um, and okay, anyway, there was all this um, suspicion that it was just a like a an exit strategy, and so. He, I think he goes on in his own um, autobiography that it was a chance for him just to get out of the rat race, which is quite interesting. Yeah, he sounds like he had the weight of the world on him at that point. I mean, even for someone as free-spirited as him, it must be hard to go that against the grain. Uh, well, ag but against the grain, um, imagine the schedules too. Um, I imagine the management of it all certainly wasn't up there with what it is today. Um, probably less regard for looking after the body, <laughs> although I'm not sure how much that's actually yeah. progressed either. <laughs> <laughs> not in rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, and it sounds like it's interesting because after that, this tour that he did, the Rolling Thunder Review, was quite the opposite of um, a heavily managed stadium tour you know <laughs> yeah this was a a much uh a much cool calm and collected tour it <clears throat> it actually wasn't a commercial commercial financial success um no <clears throat> and they talk about this in the documentary uh but dylan i think dylan actually says himself yeah it financially wasn't a success, but if that's your measure of success, then, um, yeah, that's to your own detriment is, is basically what he says. Um, because he thought mm. the intimate shows were just such a, a big thing for his brand and the, this almost communal touring way of life that was kind of developed across the year or so year or more of touring that went on for this, uh, created something else and really kind of blew his brand up, supposedly. Mm. Um, as 
as I said, mentioned earlier, there's mm. way too much to cover since the 60s, but he's done endless tours, endless writing, endless producing, art, awards, and then all the uh, controversial receptions and, you know, fame and glory. So he's had some big col- collabs, though, with, you know, Elton John, George Harrison, Eric Clapton, Mark Knopfler, um, Billy Nelson, Slash <laughs> from Guns N' Roses. Um just everyone that you know, everyone would love to work with him, obviously. Yeah. And and there's so many more too. Yeah, they were just a pool, a few that yeah. I plucked out. Uh so it, just ridiculously iconic generation changing, you know, talent that is just such an interesting person. Um that is just it's just a mystery, this guy. Yeah. 75, uh, he he actually started using this. Um, he was always politically active, but he, the song Hurricane was actually, was written about the champion boxer Ruben Hurricane Carter, who was falsely imprisoned for a triple murder. And uh, this certainly fell under the, um, you know, the racial discrimination bracket um, back then. And he, that whole song was purely written to create a movement to get him, you know, uh, uh, acquitted and, you know, mm. you know, retrialed basically. And that's what happened and he got released, which is pretty incredible because that also set a bit yeah. of a precedence uh, for things moving forward and helped that, 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 you know, that movement itself. 1988, yeah. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, Bruce Springsteen introducing it said, Bob freed your mind the way Elvis freed your body. <laughs> he showed us that just because music was innately physical did not mean it was anti-intellectual. Uh, 1997, yeah, he was hospitalised with a life-threatening heart condition. <laughs> and he actually, he genuinely thought he might, he might die. And a lot of people, you know, the doctors and everything did too. Uh, but he made a speedy recovery and uh, that's, you know, by middle of that year, he was back touring and performed in front of John Paul II, the Pope at the World Eucharist Conference. So um, he, was, he was straight back into it. Yeah, got back on the horse. Yeah, seriously. Legal opinion yeah. study in 2007 revealed that he was the most quoted songwriter by judges and lawyers, um, for, you know, 186 versus 74 in second place for the Beatles. Which is that's that's mm. very cool, um, you know, being that's being quoted in the courts, really cool. in cases, uh, and Love it. he's done lots of stuff since then. So you know, lots of awards. Twenty twelve Presidential Medal of Freedom from Obama, um, and as I mentioned, the the handwritten note. So he's released thirty eight studio albums, ninety one singles across his his time so far. Um, I don't think he's gone dormant. Yet, um, and over a hundred million records. Apparently, sold. stuffs. Yeah, apparently, stuffs took a massive dive in the. You know, like he could barely sing you know, <laughs> for a while there. His voice is completely different. It's really just raspy now. And but apparently, stuff over the last few albums has gotten quite a lot better again. So, um, but he never stopped. He just. He's always Never experimenting, you know. He's always trying these new things. I, I had to listen to a few different albums last night just across the, the years and they're all so different. Like moving from like jazz into folk into you know, more electrical stuff into you know, there's grungier things in there, you know, always with this kind of poetic, you know, lyrical elements and um, the kind of folkiness to them but – Crazy. Mm. So I think what does – what the hell is this documentary about? <laughs> well – We pulled a couple of things out of it. I was, I was, I was going to say, mate, there's, there's a really interesting opening scene. Uh, do you remember the opening scene? Uh, it's like a black and white – weird old movie isn't it or something like that is that right yeah correct which is the there's like a magician and so there's a lady sitting on a seat and she pulls the the sheet over her and then you can see this like 
cut in the footage. Like it's a very obvious cut in this you know, old school footage. Um, the woman disappears and then two seconds later reappears as, you know, and that's the magic trick. Um, and I wondered what that kind of was implying across the entire nature of this whole film. You know, is it all act? Is it not an act? You know, what the authenticity to it? And I, it got, it got me thinking about the character of Dylan and, and, mm. you know, he had a lot of famous, you know, infamous um, uh, things that he did and the way he presented himself and showed himself uh, through his performances. Um, but I just, I can't see how he could do what he has done without being that being the real thing, the real deal, you know? Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's obsessed by music, you know. It's, it's his one life purpose. I think it's hard to go past that. He's in, incredibly dedicated to... But I think from what I could tell, he was really dedicated to the, the poetry of the music, you know. Like um, when I was watching him play i play some guitar and i've tried to play a few of his songs and they're not technically very difficult songs to play uh, a lot of them some of them are but it's really in the words that is the magic of bob dylan i think uh, and i don't want this to dive divulge into our uh critic of <laughs> amateur critic of his music it's more around i think there's a couple of things about this film that just really stuck out that are worth discussing around what does this tour actually mean and what was it like to be in that kind of environment that they created um what is this magic of dylan and what's all the symbolism going on with him and then why is he so special? Like what does he do and what can you learn from that? Um, like what is the enigma of him and how does he act and those sort of things? Yeah. So well, how about, how about um, you know, for those that aren't aware, just it's very easy to pull up a picture um, of him in performance, but, you know, it's the, the white painted face or mask um, that he's known for and the – yeah, the kind of a Kubra like hat um, with the floral arrangement on the side. Um, that's, you know, they're, they're definitely standouts in terms of his character and part of that stage routine, you know, particularly for this role. C in certainly in the, just in, yeah, in this period, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was the, the, the enigma of this time, <laughs> this character. Yeah. And it looked pretty cool, I thought. I liked it. So did I. Um, at, at, mm. I, think, I think at first, first glance, you kind of – because I, I, I genuinely – I'm sure I'd seen it, but I, I hadn't really you know, looked at it properly until seeing this documentary. Um, and you kind of double take the first time. And then if, you know, shortly after, you're like, wow, this is, this is quite, quite good, quite cool. Quite groovy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He says that something interesting about the, you know, his stage persona where he said when someone's wearing a mask, he's going to tell you the truth. When he isn't wearing a mask, it's highly unlikely. Which is, pr I mean, there must be something about him being able to get out there and say what he really feels if he's, you know, puts on this mask or is it more an expression of, uh, that that's kind of what everyone does. I don't know. Well, I think it. I think but it really. I, I was going to say, mate. I think it really nicely ties into um, uh, the book, The War of Art, and uh, it, he actually, book. yeah, which is Stephen Pressfield. I should should say, and he actually mentions Dylan uh, and Lennon uh, during the book, and he says, 
uh, he discusses the way that the muse is the muse is always with us you know this this creative thing and um you know, have you seen interviews with the young John Lennon and Bob Dylan when they the reporter tries to ask about their personal selves? The boys deflect these queries with withering sarcasm. Um, you know, the part that writes the song is not them. They also know that the, that part of themselves is too sacred, you know, to be summed up in a few words. So it's always like, mm. it's always this this enigma. It's always this this thing that's left for the performance for the stage to almost give it the most energy that it deserves to not, you know, dilute it. Mm. Yeah. That's finding something deep inside yourself, isn't it? Yeah. And all, all Um, the way he dresses and acts and, you know, the mannerisms that he's got all go into this development of the character. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, I guess to be, to be different, you've got to kind of be different, which that is, it doesn't sound like it means anything <laughs> as I say it, but I guess it's like, sometimes I find myself thinking, oh, it'd be great to, you know, stand out as an individual or be seen for this, this or that, you know, like we all do, um, and then, but not really willing to be, look or feel or say anything different or outside of the realm. Whereas he, you know, really embraces that. And a lot of, like, I guess that's what a lot of music is, um, is people are, a, exp- it's a really an expression of yourself really, isn't it? And I mean, oh, I don't know, but that's probably a good question, but it's certainly part of it. Um and he is not afraid to look, act, plug the electric guitar in at the folk festival uh, and do what he does. And that'll probably flow on to some of our other discussions, but, he, you know, he doesn't follow the normal, but he's really dedicated to the gr- honing his craft so he is, a, you know, unsurpassed basically. Um so though that combination of things really means that he stands out, but he stands out for a reason. Not only that his music's so good, but also that he's willing to look and be different and be a bit confrontational to you or something like that. Yeah. Shock the senses. He Do you do you think it's do you think it's like to be different? Or do you think it's more a shining of his authenticity you know there is this muse i'm going to use the word muse yeah um that exists that is that dylan on stage you know the the white face and the hat and everything else um and but do you think that that what you see and what you feel and what you hear and everything else is all just it's this authentic it's his He's trying to get as authentic as he can to what it is that that whatever's trying to come out in him in that craft. I think I think it's an authentic expression of whatever he's trying to express. You know, he might be trying to express a certain feeling or emotion or story, but I don't think it's like necessarily him at his core. Right? It's a show. Uh, but it's a show to express something about him or something like that, you know, like a hundred percent. I think you've you hit know, the nail on the head, man. I think you've hit the nail on the head because, yeah. and that, that exactly ties in right. into Pressfield, what Pressfield said. Um, well, good. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> show done. Show finished. <laughs> uh, uh, so nice quote. Which I, you and I both pulled out for this episode. Uh, life isn't about finding yourself or finding anything. Life's about creating yourself and creating things. And there's something really nice if about you're that. You're giving us a little bit more pizzazz, because it means a bit more you can be anything. One, mate. <laughs> well, all right. Well, you do it. <laughs> no, no, you've done it now. We don't want to dilute the. Uh, dilute I've ruined the it already. The best. Uh, yeah, the best quote of the 
whole episode's just been massacred. Um, but there's something really nice about that because it kind of gives you agency to find your own life, right? Um, or create your own life, as he says. Um, not this kind of search in the dark for yourself. There's a latency. There's a there's like a heaviness about finding yourself somewhere, and there's just you're going to find it, and it is what it is, you know. Is that what you kind of take from that? A hundred percent. Yeah. He, I think this is part of building that real charisma that he had, you know, and um, I think that charisma that he had came from the authenticity of who he's being and because of what he's trying to create. Um, mm. And it kind of shines its way all the way through. Uh that yeah, that was a that was such a such a nice quote. Um, pulling that one out. Mm. So, I my, one of my main takeaways from this episode, from this episode, from this uh, documentary, um, was that he just doesn't ever look. He's in constant motion. He doesn't look back. He's always, always, always doing, moving forward. You know creating himself or creating something because he doesn't even seem to be able to be pinned down for a conversation almost. Yeah. And if, and if he is pinned down for a conversation, did you notice that? Well, yeah. I mean, it is a documentary, but he, I've, I've actually heard that um, when he is pinned down for a conversation, you're not going to get much about him out of it. It's going to be lit, very little revealed. You might get some sort of, um, you know, deflected answer or some sort of, um, you know, lyrical response that you need to then go away and digest as to what the hell that means. Um, he seemed even he seemed pretty squeamish, even just to sit down and get interviewed for this movie. Yeah, there was only snippets, wasn't there? Yeah. Um, I think as far as I can tell, it kind of made him intoxicating and infuriating to be around at the same time <laughs> because there, it creates this sense of mystery. Uh, but he just doesn't put any – he's not a nostalgic guy. He's just like – and you can see that, by the way, that he's still creating music now. Most people are going around touring their greatest hits for one last time for an extra 10 mil. You know, but he's out there still creating music, you know. Yeah. It's – and probably, arguably, a lot of it not very good. So he doesn't seem to give a shit though. <laughs> yeah, but maybe maybe that's just to our amateur ears, mate. Maybe it is good. Maybe we're just not on that level. Well, it's subjective, yeah, I guess so. Um, but he said that at the right start of the movie <laughs> they asked him – um, oh yeah, you know this whole film's about this this tour, and he said, "Well, they sort of asked him, well, what, what do you think about this? What was it like?'" He said, "Well, I'm trying to get to the core of what this Rolling Thunder thing's all about, and I don't have a clue because it's about nothing. It's just something that happened 40 years ago. I don't remember a thing about Rolling Thunder. It happened so long ago, I wasn't even born." So this is kind of his attitude, and he, whether that's put on or not, I don't know. I'd get the feeling from his actions it's not put on. I think he wouldn't have thought about that in a long while. Uh, and you kind of contrast that with the fact that it's such a significant cultural movement. He's done a lot of different stuff since then. You know, He's, a lot's happened since true. since that since that tour. Like, so it's it has to be has to be true. But he almost. When he said that, it, it was just like it sounded like him looking back on his, you know, naive teenage self. And he's just like, yeah, it was just some some guy, you know, some some naive self, you know, many years ago. <clears throat> I've grown up a lot since then. Is kind of what I, the way I interpreted it. Yeah, I think that's probably that's probably the way I take it to a point too, but I, I also feel like I got the feeling that it didn't matter to him. 
really. Yeah, he just yeah. showed up every time, every day, did his thing and kept moving on to the next one and kept creating, kept yeah. hiring. And like this is a this is a tour where, you know, there's pictures in this um documentary where people after the the concerts are just crying. It's so moving. <laughs> What the fuck's going on in this thing? It's crazy. Uh, well, I think it's a... It's, but for it's, most people... Sorry, mate, you go. I was going uh, to... There's a real <clears throat> energy that develops, you know, between the crowd and him, um, which which we'll get onto mm. in a tick. But I, you know, I, I was trying to really engage myself in the in the in the film as it was going through just you know trying to particularly after you because you hear things of how you know how exhilarating the performance is or you know how involved the crowd is and how emotional they get and so you kind of just sit there and because there's a lot of you know a lot of just performance throughout the show um a lot of it was you know and for someone that's not into folk it was it was quite interesting. I, I quite enjoyed it. It sucked. Yeah, it caught me. Definitely. I, I wouldn't say I'm a big fan of that type of music. Um, but for most people, like an experience of the past, is it compounds over time. So it gets more important over time, like the memories you have or um, whether it be, you know, thinking of a time where you, you saw a, you spent some precious time with someone who's no longer with us or you went and saw your favourite, you saw a well, messy kicker goal at the World Cup final, you know, that, that sticks with you and it gets more precious or, you know, the $2 million handwritten note, right? Um mostly it seems that doesn't necessarily apply to him because he's he's kind of on the move and I, I pulled out another quote on this point where they interviewed uh, Reuben Hurricane Carter, as you mentioned, that he wrote that song about. And he says, every time I see him, I ask, have you found it yet, Bob? And Bob says, yeah, I've, yeah, I found it. But I know he hasn't because he keeps on searching for it. So. And then, and then he goes on to say, um, uh, "No, you haven't. You're still searching, Bob." Yes. <laughs> so, what are you searching for? And he says, uh, um, "The Holy Grail." <laughs> um, I'll let you know when I found Sir Galdorf or you know, whatever it is. <laughs> Sir Galahad, sorry. <laughs> um, there you go. Yeah, I. I the what you said before was quite interesting. Those those memories that kind of build in, you know, nostalgia and build in importance. Um, they're only ones that really hit emotional peaks for you. And so, when uh, when you're um, at a concert, in particular or you're in a big crowd of people that is really getting involved. You know, there's a lot of energy there um, mm. in something. There's, <clears throat> there's, you you can't do anything but get involved, you know, like yeah. there's something, something there that happens and you just feel the energy in yourself and you, you get really you know, excited about what's going on. And so that kind of sets just that alone sets a baseline and you know because of the hype that was there you know there was a massive hype he had a massive following and like a passionate true fan following um you know to the point of being a cult really um, at least what was portrayed in this and just setting, just coming into that with some fresh eyes, with all the hype, coming into that with with 
all these fans sitting there, you're you're you know you're already hit almost hitting that without doing anything, <laughs> you know, without actually enjoying the music. You're almost mm. already hitting that emotional peak for something to look back on. Just through the atmosphere. Just through the atmosphere. Yeah. Of it. So I imagine that has a big influence on it. So, so you hit on an interesting point. Perhaps it's worth talking about the greater ecosystem that he created on this tour. So it wasn't just him rolling around with a kind of backup singers or a band or what have you. It was a group of talented, very, very talented musicians kind of cobbling together, right? Yeah. It doesn't just um, – the there isn't just the the character of, of Dylan himself. The, it's beyond that. There was this whole ecosystem which the character was, you know – interacting with and living and breathing it you know he was living and breathing what it was all all that his craft was about um you know they were always talking to one another in these you know almost like this code is the way i felt it um i think patty smith was speaking at one point in time um and i think she's actually somewhere right now but she like she just says he's like you know, Superman takes a piece of coal in his hand and he starts squeezing it, squeezing it. And he goes on, she you know, rambles on for a little bit longer and then she says, after years and years of kids kicking around, it becomes smooth, you know, it becomes a diamond. And I was just like... And Bob's, you know, Bob Dylan's there. He's like, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and so... That's just rubbish, isn't it? Well, <laughs> but, but see, the thing is, maybe there's just this... You know, they're just operating on a completely different level, but, you know, they're, they're always talking I in these it, metaphors. You think about, like, us talking just, in slang, <clears throat> yeah. you know? We talk in our yeah, own little slang. It's not about the words, is it? It's about the feeling, is it? Mm. And they're always, like, very, fi- very yeah. narrative-based. They're always stories. And so it was almost yeah. – it almost created this, like, click and <clears throat> you – you know, you had to to get into the click because the click, you know, you want to get into the click, um, which kind of builds the hype. You, you know, you needed to you needed to be like poetic, or you needed to be pretty out there. Um, and you know, I was really interested because I imagine, and you could see it that there was all these people that, at least in the documentary, that you know wanted to get in. They wanted to you know, do whatever it that they mm. could to, to get involved in the crew. Um, but that was inauthentic, you know, like, cause they were, mm. they weren't being themselves. Um, yes. But maybe Dylan actually had an eye for that. And cause he did ask some people to come on the tours and things with them. Cause this, this rolling review was really like a, it's almost like a moving commune <laughs> that was moving around uh, the tour. Yeah. <laughs> People jumped on, jumped off. But it seemed to me that they talked about him. He really uh, spent a lot of time by himself. He he seemed to really, like they kind of said, the only time we really saw Bob was when he was performing or driving the bus. Um, so I think he kept a real tight crew around him. And, again, the enigma of that is that when he comes out and speaks to you, you're being spoken to by the great one or something, you know. Um, but I, I tend to agree with what you're saying. It, it, it's, it's tribal what they were doing, you know. They were getting in these small rooms, playing these instruments, singing, talking in kind of a trance kind of way and doing a lot of drugs. Uh, it sounded like some bad stuff happened on that tour too, you know. Um, but it was just a little bit out of control, Uh but very, very creative. It definitely, it definitely got to the place of sounding a little bit like a cult, you know, um, mm. you know, which, which, you know, was probably part of the, part of the movement itself, you know, like part of, you know, that was one of the successes of the tour is creating that, you know, building that cult following, you know, the, the thousand true fans. Just the creativity. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of interesting because there was sort of a competitiveness between some of the musicians, I thought, too, uh, which 
meant that they were, you know, making good music, you know? Yeah. yeah. They actually mentioned, they actually mentioned that, uh, uh, we, you know, we were all there. We were all performing for the show, but we also all wanted our chance in, you know, the, the limelight. They all wanted their shot to, to sing with Dylan. And, um, yes, it creates some, there's, there's definitely some competitiveness, but I wonder if it actually creates some, you know, inauthentic undertones just for people to get in the mix. So I imagine it, it sounded yeah. like people were cut pretty quickly uh, as well. Like people disappeared <laughs> almost. Yeah. Which is, which I think is probably a good thing. Um, yeah. I'm assuming that Dylan kind of shuffled people off that he realized, uh, I'm just making wild assumptions here, by the way, um, that he probably cut people off pretty quickly once he realized that they weren't, maybe weren't the real deal or were just doing it to get to a, mm. get somewhere, which is good. Yeah. Interesting. Um, they actually interview one of the, the sh- like their chauffeurs throughout the show. And, um, you know, he actually says he doesn't go to rock concerts and n- never goes to this type of thing, but he actually got invited to go into, into one of the shows. And, and he says, you could not only feel the vibes, you could almost see them. There was a love affair between the performers mm. and the audience. And so it was like this yeah. building, this building between, you know, this throwing backwards and forward between Dylan and the crowd and, you know, the charisma that's coming off him in this trance-like state on stage um, to the crowd that, you know, also becomes part of that, which is just crazy. Yeah, this is something like he's such a softly spoken guy, it seems, most of the time um, off the stage. And then he gets on there. And there's just like this fire inside him and the intensity is palpable. You can feel it, you know, when he's singing and the way he focuses on um, these kind of long-winded stories that he tells through his music. But I, I just feel like, yeah, it's almost a rage I, I kind of saw in him. <laughs> but channeled, you know, in the right way, like, and it got me thinking about what – is there anything in your life that you have approached with that much conviction? It's just an interesting thing to ask yourself. Um, I definitely don't. You know, if you – no. The only thing I can think of that's come close is maybe when I've been playing sport or something like that um, in another type of flow state. But even then, I, I don't think so. And so if you really – the combination of him really not giving a fuck, let's be honest, about what other people think, his extreme devotion to his craft and then this kind of intensity when he brings it just makes him, I think that's part of what makes him so unique. That's really interesting. You mentioned like sporting, you know, playing sports. So like these competitive games and they, they bring it, you know, they're kind of, this defined, you know, set of rules and system that kind of allow for, you know, and you're competing against others that allow for these flow states to to rise up. Um, but he's doing it in this space that there is no rules or, you know, there's very few rules or he at, le- at least he particularly sees it that way. And I think it makes it really hard to do it then unless you're fully, fully committed to it. Uh and, and know yourself pretty well, right? It also seems that, you know, this this might be like a, this is kind of like a Peter Thiel thing, but, you know, did he seem like he was competing? Because it didn't to me. It doesn't seem like he was competing with no. anyone. He just wants to, he just wants to be him. And he just wants to do him and find that. And Correct. It wasn't, it wasn't competing against an enemy or anything, no. But it's like taking all the energy just, that you get out of being in a constrained game and having competition, getting rid of both of those things and then still having the same intensity, um, in, you know, intensity of energy and devotion to it without those two core things that generally drive, uh, drive us um, in a big, big way. You d- yeah, you're just in such a vulnerable, exposed state 
out on a stage like that, right? And, okay, people loved him by then, but he was always taking these huge risks with his music. So, and, you know, daring people not to love him almost, you know, with the way he was changing it up. So there's really, you've really got to be, you've got to have the confidence to really be great and just be yourself and just to put yourself out there with that much conviction takes a lot of something. I don't know what it is, right? Well, can you imagine being so committed to that? Can you imagine being on stage and there's a crowd booing for a start, like at all? Just, just imagine that. Mm. Um, and then there's some, you know, maybe some that are cheering, but just getting heckled, being booed on stage and either playing through it or just fucking walking off stage. <laughs> like, yeah, that's it's ball. That is so like, ballsy. I know. It took a lot, a lot, a lot of time and thinking about it just to put this podcast out for me, you know, Um uh, like it's just different level. Um, so, what what have you learnt from this, mate? What do you learn from this guy and seeing him in this this the element and and this tour? Have, have you figured out what you could take away? Um, yeah, there, there's two things, right? What's I think it was it's probably more last year, mid last year. What was like you know the top trending book that was kicking around? Um, uh, the subtle art of not giving a fuck. And so I think, you know, I think Dylan, you know, he epitomizes that for a start. And so that's kind of one, one of the things. And, you know, you kind of mentioned this, this podcast. Uh, it was, it was definitely tough for me to, uh, to, to, to get on and, get going with something and and so if that can be encouragement for anyone to just do something they're scared or concerned of failure or whatever else that's that's a big one mate um you know what is there what is there to lose really is is the big thing there genuinely what is there to lose nothing really not much just give it a go and that was one. What are, you, what are you getting out of no, what are you getting out of not doing it? It's a good question too. Mm. You always got a you've always got a good question to shift up the perspective, mate. Keep those coming. <laughs> Cheers. Um, yeah, so that was that that, one, that was one, one one and number two is like absolute authenticity and and just showing how to, yeah. to the extent that you can go to be dedicated to a craft. Um, so what about what about you? I think just similar. Um, I think I wrote yeah. Have the confidence to be great, you know. Uh, and I want to try and find a way to bring that fire to the things that I do, you know, and really bring that not be too scared to bring total energy to something because it makes you look silly if it doesn't work. And bring art to what you do, you know. And that's something for me I need to do more of is get more in touch with music and, and maybe after this read some poetry or something, you know, like just I think there's, there's power in that as well as just, I don't know. Do what you really like doing. I'm not necessarily talking about for a job, but and just keep practicing it and keep moving. Yeah. Mm. It's yeah. pretty inspiring. Yeah. The real the real like build that ecosystem, ecosystem around everything that you know, for 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 you, you know. Uh, mm. I, I love that. Um we it was inspiring in a way that you really you really didn't want to be him. Yeah. But there's just something about it that just drew me in so much. But he was he was so he was so into it that he wouldn't be any other way. You know? He he, he Yeah, yeah. 
it wasn't really a choice for him. Yeah, and I'm sure he it, it would cause him more pain to not have been that way. Yeah, and he's human too, right? So mm. we all have fear, etc., normal emotions, but geez, he pushed through it. Should we close out with the, uh, a quote from the Oracle of Delphi <laughs> or a.k.a. Allen Ginsberg, <laughs> a.k.a. the father figure, a.k.a. not the father figure, depending on who you are? So who was this? So there's, there's a guy throughout the entire film, for those that don't know Allen Ginsberg, uh, he's a famous poet and um, he seems like the guru basically throughout the entire, the entire show. Um, and he has, there's a few times throughout the, throughout the documentary that he has a couple of, um, you know, says a couple of his poems, um, <laughs> fun, strangely, he, he, he was, there was some poem that he did where he was talking at like an aged care home, um, you know, with some elderly, it was just elderly ladies, uh, there and he, he was, he, you know, he's talking about some like pretty morbid things. And then he starts just throwing in these like, f- like really fucking grotesque, you know, visual examples of you know like genitalia and all kinds of things. And you just see you see the crowd just being like, "Whoa!" <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, he was he was the guru right, of the of the group, and um, everyone saw him as a father figure except for Dylan, of course, um, going the different way and. But he always, you know, he was like running meditation, you know, classes every day, and you know, he'd be, he was actually quite renowned for his poetry. So he closed out the entire documentary with, uh, with this one, one quote. So, Lucky, do you want to do the uh, the honors, mate? You got a bit more fire in this one, though. All right, all right, I'll fire it up. You who saw it all. Or saw flashes and fragments. Take from us some example. Try and get yourselves together. Clean up your act. Find your community. Pick up on some kind of redemption of your own consciousness. Become more mindful of your own friends, your own work, your own proper meditation, your own proper art, your own beauty. Go out and make it for your own eternity. Thoughts? You're a poet, mate. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thanks, Slightly mate. more uh, abstract one, this one. So hope you enjoyed it. Cheers, mate.